All right, we'll take a look at our two questions that we had for homework. It was um, question number eight and nine on our navigation worksheet. We want to draw those pictures. That's the toughest part of it, drawing the pictures, drawing the diagrams for, for both of these questions, I think. Uh, number eight said the captain of a ship wants to go directly north at a speed of 35 meters per second, but there's a current, a river current to the east. We have a speed of the boat without a current, 50 meters per second. It says here we want to find the speed of the wind. Really, we want to find the speed of the current, right? Just a typo there. Uh, you guys remember when we started this, the start of this whole navigation stuff, this relative motion stuff, we said we can have two kinds of vectors, solid line vectors and dotted line vectors. Solid line vectors contribute to where you actually go. Dotted line vectors are where you actually go. So something like a wind or a river current or where you aim or where you head, they're solid line vectors because they're not where you end up going. They're, they contribute to where you end up going. When, you, when you're asked to find the velocity relative to the ground, or where do you actually go, or where do you want to go, that's my dotted line vector. Okay? That's what comes as a result of all these other things, the wind and so on. So this question again says, the captain of a ship wants to go directly north. Is that solid or dotted line vector? Wants to go directly north. Does that contribute to where he goes, or is that where he ends up, actually ends up going? Yeah, where he actually goes. Okay, so that's going to be a, a, a dotted line vector, right? So let's draw that dotted line vector for question number eight. Directly north at 35 meters per second. There's a river current to the east. Okay, that's a solid line vector. And it's going to be drawn like this. Now, you can draw it in two places. You could draw it in position one, or you could have drawn it in position four. Position one, because that resultant vector, that dotted line vector, has to be drawn from start to finish. Okay, it's drawn towards the finish if it's drawn in position one there. Okay, if I draw it in position four, then you can see that the dotted line vector is still drawn from the start. Okay, so either one of those works. My suggestion is always draw it at the end. Always draw it at the tip, the arrow part of the resultant vector. So draw it up here. Okay, we don't know. Uh, what the speed of that wind is, that's what we're ultimately trying to find. Okay, but we do know that we have, it says the speed of the boat without the current would be 50 meters per second. So this is 50 meters per second. This is how fast we would go if there was no river current. But if you combine how fast we'd go without a current with the current, what do we end up getting? this speed right here, 35 meters per second north. OK, how do we find V there? A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, right? So V is going to be uh, the square root of 50 squared plus 35 squared. Is that right? No? Kathleen, what's wrong with that? Yeah, good, good. This time, this is the first time we've had this, right, where the hypotenuse is the value that we have. We're going to say, basically, v squared plus 35 squared equals 50 squared. Right? a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Or v squared is equal to 50 squared minus 35 squared. Or v is equal to the square root of that. And that works out to be 36 meters per second. Is that OK? How many people get that diagram drawn correctly? Okay, how many people struggled a little bit with that? What was the struggle, guys? Anybody want to volunteer? Was it recognizing that it was a dotted line vector that we started off with? Was it having a little bit of trouble with where to put this vector? Oh, all right. Well, let's take a look at the other one here then. And see if see if uh, one more of these helps us out. Okay. The pilot of an airplane wants to fly directly west to Vancouver. Doesn't say how fast, just say it wants to go to Vancouver. That's a dotted line vector because that's where, that's where we want to fly. That's where we actually go. Okay, that's a result of wind and whatever else. Want to go directly west to Vancouver. There's a wind blowing to the south at 25 meters per second. Notice I'm drawing it front to front, right? Because one of them is a resultant vector. 25 meters per second 
to the self. The airspeed, that's the speed without a wind, is 100 meters per second. Right, solid line vectors are drawn front to back. Dotted line vector is drawn from start to finish. What speed does the plane actually travel? I'm aiming at 100 meters per second in this direction, 25 meters per second wind. What speed does it actually travel? V, whatever that is. Once again, as Kathleen said for the last question, because we have the hypotenuse here, it's not going to be 100 squared plus 25 squared. Rather, it's going to be 100 squared minus 25 squared. When we do the math on that one, it works out to be 97, 97 meters per second. Any questions on that one? Who do that diagram correct? Probably the same people that do the last one, right? Who do that one correct? Okay, good. Do both of those questions make sense to us? Okay, good. So here's one for us. Uh, the captain of a ship aims her ship directly north across a 500 meter wide river at 10 meters per second. There's a river current of 4 meters per second to the east. We want to know what the, the ship's velocity is relative to the shore. In other words, the ship's actual velocity. Okay, not relative to the water, but relative to the shore. And then how far downstream does the ship end up landing when it reaches the other side? I'm going to give you a minute here to work on this, and then we'll take a look at it as a class once you've had a chance to do that yourself. Okay? Okay, let's take a look at it here now, everyone. The captain of a ship aims her ship north across a 500 meter wide river, 10 meters per second, river current of 4 meters per second to the east. Let's draw the river out here. Okay, there's my, uh, there's my river. Uh, the river is, is 500 meters wide, so let's draw that in here. Not as part of our vector diagram, but just as part of the bigger picture here. Uh, we're aiming north at 10 meters per second. If we're aiming north, then that's going to be a, 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 a solid line vector, 10 meters per second. There's a river current to the east. That's also a solid line vector. We draw it like this, right front to back. If it was a dotted line vector, it would be drawn front to front. The resultant vector, where we go relative to the shore, is this one right here. Hypotenuse. We can find this, right? V is equal to 10 squared plus 4 squared. Let's square root that. What do we end up getting for V there? 10 point. Sorry. 10.77 meters per second, or technically we would round that to th two digits, so it would be 11 meters per second. All right, let's find theta. Theta is always drawn at the start of the vector diagram. It's equal to the inverse tan function of opposite over adjacent, 4 over 10. What do we get for the angle there? Kathleen, do you have the angle there? Okay. Anybody have that? 22 degrees, sounds about right. And this would be 22 degrees what of what? Over you have that? Uh, not northeast. It is going in that northeast direction, but that angle is not measured from the east, it's measured from the north. So it would be east of north. Does that make sense? They measure, the angle is measured from the north as opposed to from the east. 22 degrees east of north. All right, good. B, how far downstream does the ship land? Well, if we do this like the question that we did on Thursday or Friday of last week, then we're going to find the time first. Okay, we find the time by saying V is equal to delta D over delta T. Rearrange it. T ends up being equal to delta D, delta D over V. Uh, let's use the 500 meters for the delta D. What V would we use here? Remember, we've got to be consistent, right? If we're using the 500 meters, the y component of the displacement, then we've got to use what? 
we've got to use 10 meters per second, the y component of the velocity. 500 divided by 10. You're allowed to use the 4 or the 11. But if you do that, then you've got to use its corresponding displacement, not the 500 meters. That works out to be 50 seconds. Now let's turn around and say, D is equal to delta D over delta T. Let's rearrange this to solve for D this time. Becomes V times T. How far downstream do we go? Well, we're going downstream at 4 meters per second. If we want to find out the distance downstream, then we need to use the velocity downstream, 4 meters per second. Multiply that by the time at 50 seconds, we end up getting 4 times 50 is 200 meters, 200 meters downstream. Does that make sense? There's a couple other ways to do that as well. I think we touched on one or two of the other ways to do it on Friday as well. Okay, but this is the way that I like to do that question. Any issues with that? So if you were to have a quiz on something like that tomorrow, you'd be okay? Good. We're going to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, we're still going to talk about vectors, but it's going to be a smaller part of what we're talking about here now. We're going to focus for the next couple of days on something called projectile motion. You guys just saw for the demonstration that we just did that one object, as it falls straight down, another object, as it's propelled outwards horizontally at the same time, will both hit the ground at the same time. What does that tell us about the motion of the object that's dropped straight down and the motion of the object that's propelled outwards? It tells us that the x component of the velocity of the object that moves outward, the x component of its motion, right, the one that's propelled outwards like this, is independent of the velocity of the object that falls straight down. In other words, the x component of the velocity is independent of the y component. Since the object that falls straight down hits at the same time as the object that's propelled outwards, these two things don't affect each other. The x and the y don't affect each other. What's the shape of the path? We know the object that falls straight down goes straight down. What's the shape of the path of this object that's launched horizontally? I'm going to draw a couple pictures here. I want you to take a vote on which one's right. Okay, let's draw. Let's make a little bit more space here. Here's the edge of the building. It goes off like this off the edge of the building. Who thinks it's going to do the roadrunner thing and go out like this? Okay, it's a guy running off the edge of a building. He runs out like this. He's suspended in midair. He looks down, and then he starts falling. Who votes for that one? What, nobody? Haven't you guys ever watched cartoons? It's on TV, it must be true. You're right, it's not that. Maybe that's not what happens. Who thinks this is going to happen? It's going to go down like this. Yes, kind of? Maybe? Maybe? Jazz, you're showing some leadership there. You're wrong, but you're showing some leadership. <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes being, a, sometimes being a good leader is more important than being right sometimes. Just stretching your arm. Hey, yeah. How about this one? Who thinks this one is going to be the shape of that? I got a few people putting their hands up now. Yeah, that's right. What's that shape called? Anybody know? Good. It's a parabola. Good for you. How many people were thinking that? Everyone's going to put up their hand now, right? Everybody was thinking it. They just didn't put up their hand when I asked you. Yeah, Jeff, it is a parabola. Uh, and we'll see in a few minutes uh, how we know that it's a parabola based on the equation. For those of you who have done parabolas in math class. Uh, what is a projectile, first of all? What, a projectile is an object that moves through the air under the influence of gravity. So if you drop the bullet straight down, it, influence, it's, it moves through the air under the influence of just gravity. Technically, it's a projectile. 
But this bullet does too. The one that's fired straight out and goes down like this. When we talk about projectile motion, even though technically both of these are projectiles, this is the one that we're really thinking of. The one that follows that parabolic path, that parabola. Now, we said a minute ago that there is one force acting here during this whole thing, whether you're talking about the bullet that's dropped straight down or the bullet that's launched horizontally and then kind of falls, goes through this parabolic path as it falls. We said that the one force that acts is gravity, which acts downwards. If there's only a downward force, then the motion horizontally must be constant velocity. If there's no forces acting horizontally, then it can't slow down and it can't speed up. So as that bullet moves through the air, its overall velocity will change, but its horizontal component of that velocity won't change. It remains the same throughout the entire trip. And because it's a constant velocity for the entire trip, we're always going to describe the x component of its velocity by our constant velocity equation. E is equal to delta d over delta t. The y component of the motion, on the other hand, is not constant velocity. We said there's one force that acts on it, and it's gravity. Gravity acts downward. The y component, therefore, experiences acceleration. So although, horizontally, the speed remains the same, vertically, the speed increases as it goes further away from where it started. If the vertical component is acceleration, then we could describe it by any of the group B equations. A is equal to delta V over delta T. Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2ad, and so on. The one that we're usually going to use, the one that's, that's used most often, is going to be this one. Remember that they're all, they're all valid. All of the uh, group B equations are valid. But this is the one that we use most often. D is equal to Vit plus... 1 half at squared. So for the y component, try that first. For the x component, try that one always, because it's the only one that will ever work for the x. So what kind of questions are we going to solve using this stuff that we've just learned, this whole projectile motion thing that we've just learned? I like these questions. I do. Because to me, I can see them. They're, they're practical. Okay, kick a football. Okay, where does it land? Okay, what's the maximum height of the football? How high does the football go? Okay, the re how fast does the receiver have to run in order to catch the football? Will the football go through the uprights to get the field goal? Okay, throw a baseball. Okay, where does the right fielder have to be standing in order to catch the baseball? Hit a baseball. Where does the right fielder have to be standing to catch the baseball. Kick a soccer ball. How far is a soccer ball going to go? Is it going to hit the net, or is it going to go over the net, or is it going to hit in front of the net? Okay, these are all questions that we can answer easily using projectile motion. Here's the first one. Maybe you think a football example isn't practical enough. How about running a buffalo over a cliff? There's a practical example for you. Well, it might not be so practical now, but it actually was quite practical. First Nations people back thousands of years ago used to do this all the time. Um, how many people have ever been to first or to uh, head smashed in buffalo jump? It's literally a cliff. The First Nations people six thousand years ago used to they used to funnel these bison into this kind of narrow corridor. Buffalo aren't the smartest animals in the world. 
Okay, they'd, they'd, get, they'd funnel them into this narrow, narrow corridor, and they'd get them running really, really fast together, this pack of a couple hundred buff, buffalo running really, really fast. That's my buffalo, by the way. I know what you're thinking. It looks more like a cow than a buffalo. Um, but that's my buffalo. Hey, you got these guys chasing it. You got these guys over here that are kind of funneling them into this narrow area. And all of a sudden, what happens? These bison get to the edge. What do they do? They just keep running. They just keep running. They go over the edge. And what happens when they go over this, they go over this 20 meter high cliff? They die. And then what happens? The First Nations people, they take the pelts, they take the meat, all of this stuff. Hey, it beats going hunting one buffalo at a time when you kill a couple hundred of them all at one time. So we got, uh, we got this area near us uh, and near Fort McLeod where these, uh, these natives would, uh, would run these bisons over a 20 meter high cliff right here. Okay, we know that they were moving at 18 meters per second when they started falling. So let's draw my bison again here. Do buffalo have tails? I don't know. Do they have tails? Little stubby tails? There you go. Little stubby tail with a pom-pom on the end of it. These bison run off the edge here. That's the shape of the path, right? A parabola. The question is, how far from the base of the cliff did they land? It's a distance right there. Well, that would be good to know, right? Okay. If somebody's running off the edge of a building, uh, that's a bad example. Why would you run off the edge of a building? Let's say you were running off the edge of a building. It was some kind of stunt. Okay? Some kind of stunt. You're running off the edge of a building. Well, where do you put that air mattress, that air cushion to catch you? Well, it might be news, useful to know that, right? Useful to know where to put it so that you don't fall on the concrete, so you fall on this, this air cushion. Okay, where are these guys going to look for these buffalo carcasses after they've ran off the cliff? Okay, what's the distance from the edge of the cliff that they land? Let's break it up into X's and Y's because it has two types of motion, the horizontal and the vertical. The horizontal, we're always going to describe by this equation Every single time, V equals delta D over delta T. The vertical, we're almost always going to use this equation. It's always valid. But then again, there's a number of other equations that are also valid. Any group B equation, this is just the one that works the most often. The strategy for solving these problems, the good news is there isn't really much of a strategy. It's just brute force. Plug numbers in and see what happens. Do we know, we know what this is, right? 18 meters per second. Do we know what V is for the X component? Who can tell me what V is for the X component? I'll give you a hint. It's easy. Yep. Uh, no, no. V is not 9.81. How fast are these bison running horizontally when they leave this cliff? 18 meters per second, right? We don't know what D is. That's how far they end up going, right? We don't know what that is. And we also don't know what T is. We don't know how far, how long they're in the air for. All right, so that doesn't seem to be all that helpful to me. One equation, two unknowns, don't know. Okay, so let's go to the Y component now. Delta D for the Y component, we do know that. What's the displacement for the up and down motion of these buffalo? Awesome. Sorry? You're close. You're real close. Not 20, though. It's. Don't change it a lot. Negative 20, right? Because it's 20 meters below where they started, right? 20 meters down. What's VI for the Y component? The instant these buffalo run over the edge of the cliff, how fast are they moving? Up and down. Dustin, zero. It's horizontal, right? Now, one-tenth of a second later, they're moving downwards as well because they're starting to fall. 
But the instant they run off the cliff, it's only horizontal motion. So VI is zero. Zero times time is zero. The vertical acceleration is neg 9.81 times t squared. Now, we can solve for t here. Half of neg 9.81 is neg 4.905. How do we get rid of the 4.905? How do we take it to the other side? Multiply by t squared, we're going we're gonna to divide it. We do that, it works out to be 4.0775 equals t squared. Let's square root that. 2.0193. So these buffalo are in the air for 2.0193 seconds before they hit the ground. So what? How is that helpful to me? Where am I going to use that to help me out here? Go ahead. Yeah, we can go back to the x component here. 18 is equal to delta d over 2.0193. How can I do that, though? How can I take the time from the y component and put it into the x component? Three words. Four, sorry, four words. Time is a... Scalar. Direction doesn't matter. So that's the only variable I can move from y to x, because it's the only one the direction doesn't matter. Okay, let's figure that out now. 2.01 times 18 gives me an answer of 36.3, or, yeah, we're going to get around that to 36.3 meters. No matter what you're asked to find, okay, whether it's how far it goes or how high is the cliff, whatever, you're going to start off the same way. You're going to plug numbers in. You're going to get something, usually time. And then you're going to take that time, plug it into the other equation, and get what you're looking for. Okay, the strategy is the same always. Write down those two equations, plug what you got into those two equations, get something, and then get something else from that. Okay? We're going to give you a couple practice problems here. And as you're working on those practice problems, refer back to this, please. You have it, have it on the left side of your desk so that you can see the method that we use for this, the recipe that we use for this, and refer back to it so that you can answer these two questions that I'm going to give you. Okay. Oh, three questions, I guess it is. Sorry. Let's take a look at those three questions, please, on page 107. See what you can do with those.